Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Tillinger, and I'm going to introduce you to uh, somebody very special that's going to do a presentation about Ubuntu and contributionism, because we need to introduce some new energy and new blood, especially here in the USA. And no one more appropriate than somebody who's actually walked the talk here in the United States, Travis Duncan, who ran for mayor of Austin, Texas last year, or uh, what was it? Was it last yeah, year? Last 2018. See, time flies. Yeah, so uh, Travis is going to really talk you through the strategy, the Ubuntu contributions and strategy, uh, working through some misconceptions and clarifying certain things about what the movement is all about and what our strategy is for the world and specifically here for the USA that is now really being taken in hand and under his very American uh, management control. So please give you a warm round of applause for Travis Duncan from Austin, Texas. Well, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Neil, and everyone who uh, arranged this conference. It's an honor to be here, really. Uh, I just flew in for the day, and um, I'm just going to go right into it um, because um, we are really at a great time in, in this planet where we have the opportunity to catalyze some amazing things and some beautiful abundance. And so um, I'm just going to assume that everyone is already familiar, at least with the fundamentals of Ubuntu contributionism. And if you're not familiar with that, go buy the book, Ubuntu Contributionism. Watch the, the second season on Gaia. Dot com. That's a great uh, Michael's Hidden Origins. And watch the One Small Town video. These are really fundamental um, aspects of, of moving forward here. So, um, so first, and I also just want to acknowledge my wife, who's not with us right now, but she helped me. I mean, she's my mentor, my guide, my, uh, my teacher, and uh, she brings a lot of this simplified, holistic energy to, to what the work that we're doing. So today we're going to contextualize, we're going to reframe, and we're going to clarify some things about the Ubuntu movement. First, the spirit of Ubuntu is something that I think we all grow up, we were born understanding this, and, and we're born with this integrated into our being. And it's only through as we know the the society's story uh, that that it becomes forgotten so it's in everything we do i think it's worth remembering that what this power means what this is all about i am what i am because of who we all are another way of thinking about this in terms of our society as of today we are only as good as the least among us we are only as strong as the weakest among us. And what does that mean about me as an individual? If I, if I see opportunities to raise up my sisters and brothers and I don't do anything, what does that say about me? What does that mean about me? So this is what contributionism is all about, is us contributing our, our highest and best selves for the highest and best uh, aspect of everything to to manifest and to to come forth, and specifically at this at this conference and conferences like this, you know this this community, due to the nature of the things that you are aware of, you have an advantage uh, because you have the gift of sight and the ability to to expand your consciousness enough to open yourself up to consider other possibilities. So, so again, this is, this is just fundamentals. Um, you know, um, th these are fundamentals that, 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 is worth, that are worth explaining to other people. When, when you start talking about, you know, the fact that money, currency, was designed as something scarce to trick us into thinking that the planet we live on is a planet of scarcity. 
And that's the key thing, is that if everybody worked hard in this system, there would still be losers because of the way it's organized, because of the way the system is organized. If everybody works like, you know, that, that, that story that we're told, right? Work hard, all these things. We all know this because the planet is a planet of absolute abundance. And uh, so it, that's something that when you are going out into the world, there's certain fundamentals that people need to understand before they can come to a realization of, oh my God, I've got to do something about this. Because once, once you know, you can't do anything but work on this. You know, coming into the awareness, this awareness completely changed the trajectory of my life. And now I'm committed to liberation of humanity because we do have a planet uh, that is absolute abundance and where everyone can live with complete vitality and abundance. And so this is what this is all about. It, remembering that, you know, we are only as strong as the weakest among us. That's so important to remember. So this system incentivize, incentivizes being a good person. <laughs> this, it incentivizes being a loving person. And that's the key because the incentive, um, the, you know, we are using the tools of enslavement as tools of liberation. And this whole society is based on incentive. You do this action to get this reward. And so how can we use that tool of incentive to incentivize cooperative behavior, incentivize working together, incentivize lifting each other up, which in turn lifts up the self. And it, it goes back to the resources. So um, what the one small town, watch the one small town video. There's a five minute version, there's a 10 minute vid version. What the one small town video clearly shows us is that this happens where you are. You don't have to move anywhere to liberate yourself. You don't have to. You can catalyze and you can be a leader in your community. And I want to go back to this because this is why I came out here to share with you is because I, I feel intuitively that there are people in this room who are ready to take leadership in this way in your community. And I'm here to, to, to hopefully and humbly bring a new perspective to something that you might have not have considered yet as being possible. And it has to do with the one small town concept, which is a, a mayor and the council and the people working together, finding a way to use the tool of enslavement, which is the corporate municipality that, that, uh, has the assets of this, the corporate entity people using that tool of enslavement as a tool of liberation. And, and so that's what One Small Town is about. It's, a, it's really important. First, I just want to um, clear up some misconceptions about, about Ubuntu contributionism because uh, there's, uh, there's these five simple principles. No money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything, a community where everyone you know, lends their skills and, and highest self to the benefit of all. Those first three confuse people. They confuse people because it is so far from the reality that we current experience, that we currently experience. And so people go, go around, they find out about Ubuntu, they run out in their town, they stand up on a soapbox and go, everyone, let's build a money-free world. And everyone goes, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Why would I? You're crazy. Because people, people are so traumatized by, I got to make it. I got to live. And if, even if people, you don't know people are traumatized by this. And if you think people are okay with money, they're just really good at hiding it. It's true. And, and probably everybody in this room, myself included, have misrepresented at some point, how much money do I really have? Well, how, how successful am I really to some people? Because we, we don't want to be seen as not having abundance, not sharing in the abundance, because it's such, a, such an inherently contradictory feeling internally. 
because we know it's a planet of abundance, yet there's this confusing thing. So this is simple. We all know this. But this is something that people do. You see on Facebook, there's probably, you know, 5,000 different Facebook groups where people say money free world. People change their Facebook name to money free Mike, you know, and, and, and they, they market it in this way, which is a, what I call a marketing folly. You know, it's, it's just, it's contradictory to um, the reality of how this is going to, to integrate and transition. Um, so, Again, this is not a centralized mandate. This is not nationalizing resources. This is not communism. This is not forcing anyone to do anything ever. This is not, we're all going to be polyamorous yogis and hippies, which people get scared of. And, you know, this is, this is, um, this is also not that I have to like you personally. You know, I don't have to like you personally to believe wholeheartedly that you deserve absolute vitality and abundance. We don't have to get along personally to understand that each other deserves access to the planet. Because as Michael, you know, so, uh, you know, sharply asked the question, why are we the only species that pays to live on earth? Why? Why are we the only species that pays to live here? And, and when you ask that question to people, people that are in the system, and, and I got to experience this really up close and personal uh, by running for mayor, because uh, I met all the political no people and all the, all the players in the game. And, and you know, uh, we had some good, good pattern disruptions. We had some really nice moments where they, I could even see it processing in them. And even the, the mayors, the current incumbent mayor who got reelected, his top aides, came up to me privately and said, you know what, I would never admit it publicly yet until the polling data shows that I can comfortably, but I agree with you, and I, what you're doing is right, and, and uh, you need to keep doing this, because everyone else is terrified. And that's, and that's one of the things I also want to offer to you, is that there's really nothing to be afraid of. Government is not something to be afraid of going into. Standing up, running for political office, with your awareness, that's powerful. To be able to, you know, quote unquote, unapologetically, even though I don't quite resonate with that term, but to come up and, and without shame, speak truth and, and also boil it down to the most relevant truths. And so that's what this is about here. We're using the tools of enslavement as tools of liberation. Just sit on this in every aspect of our society. Think about what this means at every level. When you run into an obstacle... That's a tool of enslavement. How can I use this as a tool of liberation? Think about this. It, it, it's very profound when you, when you unpack it all. So why should you run for mayor? Because those who are aware have a responsibility to do something, to step up, to do more than just talk about it, to catalyze action, to catalyze action. Because, you know... Um, the reason why one small town and Ubuntu contributionism is such a cohesive system is because it's not conflicting with the current reality. You know, it's great to go build an eco-village, but it, it has its limitations. It's great to just be in some political position or some public service position, but until you have that, that cohesive, cooperative relationship between the people and, and the municipal structure working together for the resource liberation, it, there's going to be um, more complications. So, so it's important. That's a really key step of this, of this plan. And so in order to increase the probabilities of this actually occurring and getting a mayor with y'all's consciousness, with this awareness, imagine... If your mayor knew what you knew and was as committed to living it and being it and actualizing it into the world, imagine if your mayor and your council had consensus on what's actually going on on the planet. What could happen in your community? And so everybody here might live in the same town or different towns, but imagine if every single one in this room ran for mayor 
That's increasing the probabilities of, of success. Because I ran in Austin, we got 3% of the vote. It's the 11th largest you know, economy in, in the, the United States. That, that's, that's a bigger thing. But if you live in a small town, 5,000 people, even 50,000 people, it's much more attainable. So here's a consideration. A way to trust the government is to become the government. Right? A way to ensure a peaceful transition. Because we, we, all, we all hear and we love the Buckminster Fuller quote, you know, you don't fight the old system, you build a new system. Right? And that's true. But a new system doesn't always mean going and building an entirely new infrastructure in some entirely new plot of land. A new system could just mean a new way of thinking about being in where the spot where you are right now. Just a new way of being is in itself a new system. So uh, the work of woke is not just in words. And word, you know, us sharing and getting together like this is very important. Us putting out our YouTube content and creating our, our um, you know, ascension and disclosure brands are very important. But it only goes so far. We, we, it's time that we start actualizing this into the world. So, um, yes, thank you. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, it's important that we meet the reality where we are with grace and with forgiveness and love. Because this is a trap that, that is easy to fall into, to be the judge, to constantly be pointing the finger at all the sick stuff that's going on in the world. You know, and, and it's good to be aware of it, but I, I really try to spend 5% or less of my time on that. You know what? They're, they're going to be doing that until I do something differently. Yeah. Until, yeah. I, and, and, and that's a really important distinction that I had to make, is that um, it's funny. I heard somebody say uh, the other day, you know, quit throwing your wee-wee around. And what he meant by that is stop saying, we this, we that, we... And it's ironic, because this was after I ran a campaign, our slogan was called, we are the mayor. But I realized that there was a little bit of an aspect of disempowerment in that, because it doesn't, it doesn't get the personal responsibility and the personal accountability aspect to it. I am going to catalyze this. I am going to do this. That, that when you say that for yourself... It inspires other people to go, well, shit, what can I do? You know, what, no, they're doing that. What can I do? What is my divine calling in this? And, you know, uh, the subconscious mind does not know the difference between others and self. So if we spend a lot of our time pointing the finger, we're, 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 our organs are becoming that. We, we are telling ourselves this information every time we do this. So... The subconscious mind is already Ubuntu, which is beautiful to think about. You know, our, we're already programmed to be in oneness, to be in unity. So this is what we're, this is what we're up, this is the reality we live. This is from Moana. Who's seen the film Moana? This is such a beautiful moment in this film where, you know, um, the, the other guy, uh, the, the Dwayne Johnson's character, he, he kind of represents the, the old paradigm way. Let's attack it with brute force, right? And Moana represents this resurgence of, of this heart intelligence. And, you know, she faces this with love. And, and it becomes this, this beautiful thing. You know, I, I hold it in my heart that even the nastiest, dirtiest, most insidious, violent beings on this planet that have been manipulating this species for thousands of years can come into a place of love because even they are created within that parameter in the universe. That, that is their original source. And, and, so, and they're just existing on a different plane. So, so you know, our... Our unpredictability as humans and our ability to love in the face of absolute terror is our, our strength, is our advantage. 
Again, no violence, no opposition, no conflict. This is harmonious liberation. So this is, this is all these things in action. You know, and this, this, is, this is what I feel, is that when we start to say, okay, we're going to meet the system as it is, we're going to inhabit it with a new consciousness, and we're going to use it as a way to liberate people. So what does liberation look like? Well, the tool of, let's just focus on one of these tools of enslavement, which is the tool of the municipality. It's the corporation and, you know, what they do uh, to compete with the other municipal corporations is they, they focus on, their business model is maximizing quality of life, lowering cost of living, attracting and seeding innovation. That, that's what every city chamber of commerce wants to do. That's what every mayor and council talks about. This is what we want to do in our town. And how they, you know, we know the methods that they use that, that don't work, right? Um, so a way of attracting this and making this appealing to your community, because most people in the community that are even engaged and vote anyway think about this kind of stuff. Well, how are we going to be the town of the 21st century, blah, 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 right? How are we going to compete in this new era? You know, people, are, people think about this stuff. So in order to make this appealing to people, you have to think about, you know, what are the ways to maximize those key indicators of being a good town? And this is a term I'd like to introduce, universal resource access, which accomplishes the intention and the spirit of universal basic income, except without the, the uh, deeper enslavement to the, the central banks and the corporate welfare that UBI really is. I mean, it's, it's a nice thought. However, it, you're still dependent on that centralized entity. So universal resource access is another way of thinking about part of the transition to an Ubuntu consciousness in, in, in uh, actually manifested. So what does this mean? That the, the core elements of our society, the core things that actually the municipalities are responsible for making sure are in a state of well-being, water, food, energy, healthcare, housing, education, transportation, telecommunications, these are the core things that if, by the way, and it's a big if because I actually think we've, in this dimension, we've completely avoided catastrophe in society. This whole Agenda 21 thing and blah, blah, blah. I don't buy it. I'm sorry. Like, I just don't. That's not the dimension I'm going into. I'm going into a golden age. And I hope you come there with me. And, yeah. And, and, so, and so, so in order to become resilient... Resilient as municipalities, we need to shore up these elements. We need to make sure we know how to grow food and we, we have food security and we have water security and energy security, our, our own supply of energy, which Michael and I can talk a little bit about in a bit. A bit. Um, you know, transportation, this is going to change. Things are going to evolve. You know, how can we use these, these things that we're often told to be afraid of to our advantage? How can we use these technologies to enhance our experience so that what we do is we decommodify the basic living expenses? This is, to me, phase one. And if, if a small town commits to this, it'll take them three years, if that. If a big city commits to this, 10 years. Um, maybe less, I don't know. But the point is that we're, we're, we're decommodifying, we're transferring the resource ownership from the centralized government, from the centralized corporate model into the decentralized people-owned cooperative trust. And we're going to need new tools of accountability and transparency and management and all these things. And this is where the, the, the new technologies are very useful to us. So... This is easily organized. Um, and the floor, this is important. The floor right now is nothing. Like this is where we all start, nothing. If you do nothing in this society, you have nothing. And we wanna raise the floor to absolute abundance. So that's the starting place of everyone. And again, this is how 
the towns who do this first will have the, the competitive advantage over the other municipalities. We'll have the marketplace win. It's, 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 and again, we're talking about make, meeting the reality where we are and um, helping to make this appealing for people who are still very much in their day job, in their life, in, in the system as it is, thinking about public policy in the traditional ways. How are you going to make... Uh, how are you going to give that competitive advantage to your town? You're going to liberate people's time and energy so they can maximize their highest potential. And by, in order to do that, you have to universalize the resource access. And once you have universal resource access, nobody has to work a job to survive, and therefore everyone beca can become their maximized self. And so then these small towns become the solutionary hubs of dealing with the challenges that we realistically face. You know, all the pollution is probably, the pollution is probably the biggest issue, just globally. The pollution and the war, the violence. You know, so these, these are going to need really high-tech solutions, and, and that's going to require time and energy. And actually, the towns that do this um, with the Ubuntu contribution as a model, the, the collective, uh, cooperative, cooperatively owned, people-owned businesses, these are opportunities for those businesses to create solutions for the world. You know, the little water purifiers that are, you know, $2 or what, you know, just these little things that we can sell in mass to the, the, the rest of the world. And this is what your town is going to be able to do. So you're, you're pitching to your town to become the most innovative place on the planet because we have time freedom and energy freedom of the people. We're liberated. So in your town, no one will need money to live. Yet you have billions to interact and engage with the world. And this is why going back to, we're going to build a money-free world when, you know, maybe in two or three generations, I mean, it could happen overnight. We know it's, a, it's possible, but that would take some sort of mass energetic shift in, in our consciousness. This is going to happen practically. When, when, when you're the mayor of your town and your council successfully decommodifies the, electric, the electricity, and all of a sudden nobody has an electric bill, people are going to start to go, wait a second, how did that happen? Oh my God. And then they do water next. And now we're getting organic produce from the thing. And it's only been three years. And like, wait a second, what are these people doing? It's going to happen step by step by step. And that's why you're going to have to have grace and patience and commitment. And you're going to have to have some really, really thick, resilient skin and use all these amazing methods of cleansing all those, <laughs> you know, after every day, you're going to have to cleanse and, and re, you know, refresh yourself. But this is, this is the sentiment. This is the core sentiment. So you're merging, we're merging the realities. I just want to just go through this because in the transition, we all become wealthy. We all have more money than we know what to do with because we need that money to be ambassadors for the rest of the world. Once we've liberated our town and we have universal resource access, we're going to send delegations of brilliant people to go to other towns in our neighboring towns across the world where the other, got, the other mayor got elected and wherever. And we're going to send delegations and resources and investment and ways of sharing this knowledge. You know, one of the most devastating things I hear is when people come up to me and they say, I know about this eco village and they they're already living like this. They say, why haven't why hasn't anyone heard about them? What are they doing wrong? They're not sharing. They're trying to isolate themselves from the world. That's the last thing we need to be doing. You know, go watch a Gary V video and start thinking about sharing. You know, like use use these elements from from you know our traditional culture to to bridge the gap, to be the bridge. So an important thing is, look, every being has sovereignty. There's no way that you can guarantee the outcome of the next generations. But what you can do is you can build resilience in your community. You can establish a foundation of resilience and you can educate them about the ideals that
the best guarantee for them to, to make even better choices than we, we have and for their children to make even better choices than they did is to have a loving education and to not pass on those generational traumas, which can most of our traumas that we inherit from our parents can be rooted back to the alchemical manipulation of scarcity thinking that money produces in the body and in the consciousness, which creates those violent behaviors and those neglectful behaviors. So by building this foundation of resilience, this is what you're catalyzing. So step one, you become elected mayor and you see this consciousness, you build this in your community. And then, you know, uh, you know, we hear about, you know, the seven generations mentality, you know, let's think about the next 70 generations, you know, let's really, let's really think long term for humanity. Like, you know, I think I come back, you know, I think I'm going to come back. I want to come back into a beautiful reality, you know? So, so again, it's that Ubuntu, again, you know, by, by serving others in the collective, you really are serving yourself, which is all one anyway. So, so I'm here to, to, to petition you to run for mayor. <laughs> Fuck it. Just do it. Just do it. Look, the worst thing that can happen is you can get assassinated. And then you come back anyway. You come back anyway. You get to choose where you go when you die anyway. What's the big deal? Look, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Plus, there's ways of protecting yourself. Look, don't fear the elite. Trust yourself. Trust yourself. And, and trust your truest self and honor that truest self. You know, I didn't, I didn't hide aspects of my, I, you know, when I decided to run, I, th I said, okay, everything about my life is going to be out there and I'm okay with that. I'm okay. And, and that's, that's a decision you have to make personally. Maybe you're not the one to run for mayor, maybe, but maybe you know the person who is the, the right person to do this. So when you do this and, and I'll provide my contact so we can engage and, and talk about this, because if you decide, I want to know about it, I want to help you. I want to do everything I can. Um, obviously, I didn't win, but I can tell you things not what not to do. <laughs> I can tell you how, how not to do things um, and also how to do things. So you want to identify the key issues. You want to contextualize this liberation to the policy uh, mind of your community. Um, and I want to go to Q&A. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that... Um, the first thing that we need to put in place when you get elected is a system that is non-corruptible. Because everyone always asks the question, well, what happens if you get corrupted, dude? Or like, well, what happens if, you know, they inject nanobots into your blood and you become like a stooge? It's like, all right, well, you know, we need systems. So the person who gets elected, until we establish the system that is truly decentralized power, because we do have a pyramid structure right now. We're going to have to break it down brick by brick and, and build, you know, a new shape, a toroidal field, you know. And, uh, but until then, the first thing to do is the non-corruptible systems. And so we're talking like radical transparency, you know, codify it into the municipal code. Everyone that works in public government, like, where's a body cam? You know, like, you know, think about it. I mean, so that some creepy lobbyist comes in the door, you're live. Everyone can see what you're saying right now. Like, every text I send is live published on a non-corruptible database that's open to the public. Every email I send, every word I say is, is knowable. And, and, and then you, you're non-corruptible. And that way, even because all of us could be susceptible to corruption, um, all of us have a price, so to speak. There's some button that they know how to press. So we need to outmaneuver them and be non-pressable. That's a really important point. Full sovereignty consensus, uh, honoring the, the sovereignty of all beings is so important. We can't, we're not forcing anyone to do anything. All we need is, 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 an, is an opportunity for those who want to build this liberation to do that. Your question? Okay, we're going to get to Q&A. Um, let's just do that. Let's just do that right now because um, this, is, this is the end of the presentation anyway. You know, there's no one coming to save us. 
right? There's no benevolent cosmic body outside of yourself that can, can, can act upon this awareness. That's, that's really important is that if we are waiting for some sort of global shift or we're waiting for the great transition to occur, you know, that's the wrong action. We need to be causing it to occur because the only reason we're aware of some transition is because we have some gift that can cause and can catalyze that. So, um, so look, you know, by liberation, this is the last thing I'll say, uh, through liberation, the deepest healing is going to going to occur after that. Like we're all doing our healing work now. Imagine the type of healing work that's going to happen when we have resource abundance. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's, it's going to be astounding. And Michael, if you want to come up now, we can do the Q and a, um, so that's, that's where we are. And here's, here's our contact info. That's Michael's email and my email. And, um, uh, and we have about 25 minutes for Q and A. So, this one. I'd just like to add to what um, Travis was saying, and thank you very much. It was really awesome to be able to sit out there, listen to someone else <laughs> talk about Ubuntu and contributionism. Right. What a great job he's done, don't you think? What a yeah. what a great ambassador in the USA for a new global system that is a solution to all our problems. It's become like a standing joke with me. Um, when, when people start talking about, oh, the trouble in this and the trouble with, with healing and trouble with energy and trouble with this, I go, you know, we have a solution for that. What is the solution? One small town. Oh, and what about this? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the roads are broken. Uh, you know, there's a solution for that. What's it? Uh, one small town. It's become like a joke. Uh, one small town is a solution for every problem we face as the human race. It's really that simple. If you're not aware of that yet, then please go out and make yourself aware of it, and you'll get as, as excited about it as I am and as Travis is. And that's why he's here, because it's really important for new young blood, not that he's that young anymore, but... Uh, <laughs> New young blood to step in. But you're not even 30. How old are you? I'm 30 now. 30. Yeah, yeah so but, that's young blood. But I'm, I plan on living for at least 300 years. Exactly. So. And the solution is in one small town. One small town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to see it through. Because our healers are going to be able to do that, and they can already do it in one small town. They get provided the platform to do that. I'll shut up now to take your questions. But fine, final thing to say is we didn't get to this solution and this, this confidence of having a solution overnight. It's taken 14 years to get here. It's taken since 2005 when I started talking about a world free of money and free, the, free of the control of money that we got to this point. We've had to walk the talk through various stages, go through politics, go through all kinds of stuff. Stuff to realize what not to do. Now we can stand here with absolute confidence as Travis has just done and first time for him to address an audience like this. I, hope, I trust it's going to be one of thousands of times. Yeah. So you had a question. Yeah. So I, I have a, a question and a comment. So my comment is um, that I'd love my son who's 16 to hear this kind of talk, and I think that the power is in his friend group, his peers, they're already aware of energy and, and this abundant mindset type of thinking, so I wanna know um, the best way to introduce that to them, you know, uh, very, they're very open. So that would be my first, I guess it's a question, is how to bring what you're talking about to the teens um, who are the, going to be the difference makers, I think, in this, on this planet. And then my second question is, your view of animals as beings entitled to their lives, and do you extend this beyond human beings to all beings? Because you did say that in a slide, so um, I'm curious where that fits into your ideology in, in one small town. Well, I'll, I'll start with the, the, the youngsters, because um, I did a, a mayoral forum I uh, participated in one at a high school, and that we got the best reception. I mean, yeah. I felt like a rock star in that room. Like, I, I would say things, and they were like, yeah! Like, they were on fire. They loved it, and you could see the, 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 the other candidates who really represent this old paradigm were like, oh, wow, like, this is really, this is really happening. And, 
So, you know, when, when I was 16, um, it wasn't quite explained to me about, like, what's the most radical shit you could do? Because that's what you want to do when you're a teenager. And, and really, the, the reality is, it's grow food. The most radical thing that they could do to, as teens to get together is to, like, you know, like, optimize their biofield and grow food and like learn about mushrooms and like healing the soil and getting into you know these type of things and 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 then when they're 18 run for mayor or something you know but i mean but it's it has to be explained in a context and so you know um i i don't really know the the answer about how to do that be, other than getting the how do we get the message how do we get the message to you know, how do I get the message to my son? Yeah. Let's start with that, you know, and what would you propose? Maybe you don't have an answer right now, but I'm going to email you and I want you to think. About yeah, that. well, <laughs> it, that's a really good, that's a really good question because, because, um, because look, you, you could sit your son down and, and really explain to him without any expectation or like try to remove and if the, you know, if there's any of those layers there or any of those walls, try to like, just don't even engage in that at all, but explain to him like what he can create for himself. And, you know, but the, uh, the, the other thing is too, is like, you know, I see it a lot um, in Austin. There's a lot of parents who are really on some high vibe, you know, and, and their, their kids are like, oh, mom, you're weird. But then, like, oh, my mom's like a weirdo. Like, she's one of those ladies because, and like, it's all woo woo. Because in the schools, they're teaching them to sit. They're they're, they're doubling down, you know. And so and so, you know. Um, honestly, I would say psychedelic therapy. If you if you can get him to to have a safe mushroom experience or ayahuasca experience or iboga or something, it is safe. It is, it is, it can catalyze a deep awakening. The first time I had mushrooms when I was 14. And I think it actually really opened me up to this, like, I, I, I understood oneness, even as a teenager, even though I was, I didn't understand these practical information yet. There's, there's three-year-olds in the jungle that participate in ceremony with, with responsibility, with guides, with, you know, it's not... It's not getting messed up. And the second part of your question, because I want to get, get, get around other questions, is um, uh, with, uh, it sounds like you're talking about like animal rights and veganism and, and kind of as on the surface level, but also on, on, yeah, on, a, on, a, on, a, yeah, on a cosmic level. Um, I think the more we research and the more we know, uh, again, you know, it's about sovereign choice. And... I've, I've had, I used to be kind of like anti meat eater kind of thing. And I, I, I engaged in that for a little bit and it just didn't feel right to be, to, to promote. Cause I, I just, I eat vegan just for myself personally, but for my vitality, but, um, but there are people who raise their own animals and kill them and pass with them with their eyes and they, they eat their raw hearts and, and they, they, they exchange life force energy. And who am I to say that that's not some sort of a sacred process that I'm just not aware of because of the societal upbringing I had and the disconnection we have in our, so, so a big thing in a community is identifying sovereignty violating activities and factory farming is most likely one of those. And so, it just has to be a conversation that's had. And, and, um, but also, um, in, in the beginning, it's not the most important thing. Uh, 
and, and I, don't, I don't mean to minimize that movement. I'm just saying, in the beginning, I really think it's the water. It's, it's, it's the growing the food. It's the energy. It's the housing and the, the education. Because once those fundamental things, then people will make their own sovereign choices. And eventually, one day, we might have it to where the only way you can go eat meat is if you go hunt it in the wild with your bare hands or something. I don't know. Well, there's new technology with meat grown, lab-grown meat and yeah. all of that which may shift things as well so yeah I, if, I could, I don't know. if i could add to that you know what i was joking about earlier what provides a beautiful platform to resolve those solutions one small town because yeah. all the instruments and the elements and the supply of support will be there for people to make those decisions the education the information the horror that happens in slaughterhouses will be exposed it'll all be visible to everyone the only reason i eat meat because i don't have to do the killing so I'm a, I'm, I'm a bigot about this. I'm, a, I'm lying to myself. Because if I had to kill the animals I eat, I would be a vegetarian right now. And I, I was a vegetarian before. But so we go through these processes, right? So, so the answers are in one small town. It solves all the problems <laughs> literally on every level. Because um, it creates the environment to deal with these things in a, uh, in a loving way. Because right now it's opposition, violence, and I'm, I'm throwing lamb blood on your fur jacket. I'm protesting. And it, these things don't resolve conflict. I agree with you. So I um, want to just also add about the youth, uh, the youth, and it's critical. Because if we don't get the message to the youth now, we're pretty much screwed. There will be no future because that's it. If the youth don't wake up today. Now, um, Travis is quite right when he said when he speaks to young people in high school, he feels like a rock star. I had exactly the same experience. And I've just been invited in South Africa to go and speak to one of the biggest schools in Johannesburg, high schools, to go and talk to them about money, the origins of money, and the solutions. Now, the principal and the teachers don't yet know, but it's hidden on the, <laughs> of, of the fact that I'm going to talk to them about a solution. But, but I'm invited to speak to the students at this high school uh, about the origins of money and, uh, and, and, and the social structure and solutions for the future. And, and I think if Travis can do that where he lives and if more people um, learn how to put the, the, the presentations together, the, uh, then we can have thousands of people going around doing this. The intention is we've got a brand new website that Travis just put together because we came under attack again. The Ubuntu Pla Planet ha website was hacked. A lot of money was stolen from there as well. It was nasty. We come under attack all the time now. But I think it's going to be the, fi the final time now. <laughs> We're on a much stable, more, more stable platform now. And the intention is that we put videos out there uh, in small bite-sized chunks for young people to go a short attention span but get critical information to them. So that's what's going to be happening very soon, hopefully. Yeah, they're on Instagram, they're on you know, Snapchat, they're on Twitch, they go where they are. And that's why I said Gary V is like a great person to watch, to get inspired, to meet people where they are and start thinking about that um, because it, it is all about content and, and reaching them where they are. So, you had a question? I'd like to say thank you very much for what you just said, that whole thing. I actually had a premonition about this yeah. whole thing, and I was like, why is Michael not speaking today here? Anyway, have you ever been to Germany? Yes. This what you're talking about on whatever timeline it is has already happened i can assure you your work now it's already happened i'm not from germany by the way i met a couple from germany about a month ago 30 years old and they were describing this is how they live in their town all commodities are being brought down why is Germany doing it? Because they've had enough. They want peace. On the timeline that they are on, envoys from around the world are going to be sent to Germany to learn how they did it. The communities that you're talking about. I've never heard of Ubuntu before, but thank you. In my premonition, this is what I said, victory is ours, victory is ours, victory is ours. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We can add, without any violence, opposition or conflict, because it's completely unnecessary. 
As Travis said, we use the tools of enslavement as tools of liberation because we take the energy that's thrown at us and make, we make it work in our favor. It is the most profound, twisted, poetic justice I've ever come across. <laughs> Question? Hi, uh, Travis. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. I appreciate it. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, so right now under the current paradigm, basically there's an economic incentive. So there's economic incentives for people to be doctors or an economic incentive for people to be architects. So an economic incentive for people to spend that time to get a specialized knowledge base that any community would need. So let's say we remove that economic incentive. There's no longer any money. So now someone's going to need, say, six years to become a specialized doctor. Somebody else can go in and immediately go to work, but they don't have any economic, they, you know, they're, they're, they don't need any of that specialized knowledge, so they're immediately able to go to work. They're going to be earning the same amount of, quote unquote, commodities as the person who's spending that time getting the, you know, learning that specialized knowledge to bring to the community. So if you remove economics as an incentive, what incentive would you replace it with within the community? Because that would be very important to be some type of incentive-based uh, structure so that people would want to do the specialized, the specialized knowledge skills and not spend the time. So you'd have to replace it with something. Yeah, and this, this is a really great framing of the question, and this is the question that everybody's going to have, is that five minutes, okay, so we have five minutes, so this will be the last question, and then we can powwow and, and get together later and stuff, but this uh, is really important, because we're not going to, uh, we're not going to go after anyone's practice, we're not going to try to change the business that anyone's doing, unless it's a a, an, an activity that violates the sovereignty of the planet or people on the planet, right? So if like you're like fracking underneath your house and it's like your, your water's poisoned, that's a sovereignty that violating behavior. A doctor that's in their practice, we're not going to go after them initially, right? We're, we're not, we're not going to go after them at all. What we're doing is we're, we're decommodifying the resources in the town. So that eventually that doctor is not going to have to pay electricity or water. They're going to be getting vital food. Their, their patients are going to getting, be getting healthier. And the other factor, which is sort of anecdotal, but it's very true, is that that doctor only spent that time and energy to become that specialized person so that they could make enough money to feel secure and safe and provide for their family, right? So that is their primary motivation, right? So again, this is a transition. Every town is going to look different because it, it has a little bit of a different makeup in terms of what professions are there. But the, 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 other, the other factor is, is that when we integrate all of the latest healing technologies into our community healing business, that then people are coming from all around the world to get healed, in this example, the doctor can participate in that profit sharing. And the, 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 the model is eliminate cost of doing business and maximize profits. Right? That's what the town is going to be doing for the collective business model in the transitionary period. So really, we're going to be making even more money. And a lot of doctors, a lot of people have debt. They have student debt. They have home debt. They have all these debts. There's some ways that, that I haven't, I didn't, I didn't have time to go into here, that there's some really creative ways that we can raise so much money so quickly that we can empower everyone to actually eliminate all of their debt, like pay off. So everyone's house is paid off. Everyone's loans are paid off. We're completely liberated. And then in that time frame, in that moment, the doctor may want to just spend time with their family and heal at the community wellness center uh, when, they, when they can and when they want to. I mean, I'm sure there's an element of passion involved in everybody's profession that they choose. So, but, but the short answer to your question is we're not going after anybody. We're not trying to change anyone's business. Did you have a clarification? I, I just meant uh, the incentive structure for even like an architect or, um, 
Uh, you can name the, the profession that needs specialized knowledge. So they, 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 the, right now the incentive basically is that economic structure for that safety and security. Uh, but if, that, if, that, if it's no longer there, so an economic incentive, what would be the incentive that would replace that economic, in, economic incentive to spend the time to get the specialized knowledge? We, we don't replace the economic incentive. We change the profit sharing structure. Because right now, the hospitals take the lion's share, the hospital corporations take the lion's share of those profits anyway. When we have a building that's owned, it's the, the people's hospital, that doctor could double their salary. You know, and, and because we're not, we're not, we're not uh, using the old system. So, so uh, you don't, in the transition, the incentive is an economic incentive. It, it's... The, the, the first thing is in contributionism, when you contribute your three hours a week to one of the community projects, whether it be any of them, you get free electricity. So there's an immediate win that you get as you're building a side, a parallel system to the current system. So you're, you don't have to quit your job. You don't have to do anything while we're building this parallel system of absolute abundance. And it gets to a certain stage where there, there's, there's a place where they meet and there's this perfect harmony where people are going to have the option. I can quit my job if I want to, and my family will be even more secure and more safe and more abundant. And so I hope that answers your question. If I could just add to that, you replace the economic incentive with the incentive of feeling free to pursue your own passions, your natural gifts and talents, which suddenly you'll be free to do because you no longer have to get, to, get up in the morning and go to a job that you dislike. You hate your boss, you can't stand face every day, and most people in the world, unfortunately, are in that situation. We hate our lives, we hate our jobs, we hate our boss. We want to be free. Now suddenly you'll have that freedom because you have all the security, because you're part of a community that cooperates, collaborates on every level, where every individual that has some sort of special knowledge or technology or healing or whatever gets supported so that the best of that person's ability gets shared with the whole community. So there's no more stress about survival no more worry about survival you know you're taken care of on every possible level and that's when you realize your true potential and your the, the the collective consciousness of the people in that community goes through the roof overnight everyone can pursue their love their, their natural talents and their passions and that's when you start seeing the absolute abundance come to fruition that we cannot imagine in a capitalist world that we live in today so uh, on that note I want to thank Travis for, for being brave to come and speak to you today. And uh, I think that uh, I can now finally rest in peace. And I can hand it all over to him. Uh, he's, he's ready. And uh, what a great job he's done. And, uh, and I believe that Travis, next time runs for mayor in Austin, is going to get a lot more than 3% of the votes, especially when you go after the youth. Um, it's going to be awesome. So thank you very much, Travis. Um, <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for being here and listening. Um, I'll be talking tomorrow morning. I forget what time. Um, if you're here, it'll be great to see you. And um, what else? Anything else you want to add? That's it. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you.